welcome to Counterpunch Radio. My name is Eric Dreitzer. Thanks so much for tuning in, coming back to the show. First time listeners finding the show, welcome aboard. Always happy to have you. Hope you've had a chance to go over to Counterpunch in the last couple of weeks. You will notice that Counterpunch is out there every single day with brand new content for anybody interested in all of the competing perspectives on the left, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's issues of economic development, whether it is uh, indigenous rights issues, whether it is things going on elsewhere uh, around the world. Counterpunch is the place to go to get all of the perspectives. And if you like Counterpunch and you like having that publication that you can rely on every single day, I would urge you to go over and get a subscription to Counterpunch Plus. Uh, Longtime subscribers know that our magazine was a stalwart on the left. That magazine is, of course, no longer printed on paper, but all of those columns, including the great stuff from Jeff Sinclair, all of our regular contributors, and many others are available on Counterpunch Plus. Go to the website, get that subscription, make the yearly payment, and enjoy access to really some of the best minds on the left. I really do believe that. I don't just make the pitch because I do the podcast. I say it because I believe it. And speaking of very important perspectives on the left, one of the things that Counterpunch has really been out in the forefront on for many, many years are issues of environmental degradation and the questions about economic development and so-called growth. And there's a lot of talk now on the left about the issue of growth, dare I say the ideology of growth. And I have an excellent guest with me today to talk about some of these issues. Aaron Van Sinchen is with me. Aaron is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vermont. He is also the co-author of the brand new book that I could not recommend any more highly, The Future is Degrowth, A Guide to a World Beyond Capitalism. Really excited to talk about this book with him. Aaron Van Sinchen, welcome to Counterpunch. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much for uh, writing this book, which is so timely, so important, and so needed. And of course, I'm going to ask you uh, to to answer the most rudimentary question of all, Aaron, as we begin. What is degrowth? All right. Uh, I'm ready for this. <laughs> so degrowth is... Um basically the proposal that we can have a society that achieves well-being for all, which doesn't necessarily require economic growth, um, in fact, doesn't need it. Um, and at the same time, uh, in the short term, it will have to uh, scale down on the amount of material and energy that it uses. So that's the basic proposal. So... I think that the obvious question for many of us on the left would be, so how do you, how do you have degrowth without destroying the lives of millions and millions and millions of people? Yeah. So we're, we've been told for a long time now that economic growth is the thing that um, provides welfare and benefits for people. But if you look at the things that actually do provide that, um, you know, that offer people a good life, those are things that generally work best outside of the market, therefore not uh, uh, not financed by economic growth. Uh, so those are things like health care, um, education, child care, housing, um, any, anything that really offers people a, a good life. Um, and once you start uh, taking things out of the market, uh, you really can uh can meet people's needs way way better um and so something that we're arguing is that um it's kind of been a fal uh, um uh, we've been told <laughs> that we need economic growth to even fund those things but that's not necessarily true um this idea is actually extremely recent that economic growth is what we need and it came about as a way to actually um, distract us from uh, from the real uh, needs that we have and the from the way that uh, the economy is basically bent towards um, maximizing profit for the rich, which doesn't actually trickle down to the poor. 
So it sounds to me like degrowth is another way of saying uh, critique of capitalism, right? Because capitalism is predicated on growth. So in essence, you can't be in favor of degrowth without also being in favor of an anti-capitalist worldview, right? That's right. So we argue in our book, we explicitly put forward, you know, not everyone agrees with this, but we put forward that degrowth means a critique of capitalism. So I want to ask you a little bit about uh, a, a term that gets used throughout the book and in various parts, but I think it's worth interrogating a little bit. Uh, you used, you and your co-authors um, used the phrase hegemony of growth. Can you explain what the hegemony of growth is, what it looks like, and I think maybe most relevant, how that actually translates in governance under various systems? Yeah, so we often understand capitalism as as a system based on on the maximization of profit. So on or what some people call accumulation or the expansion. What we argue is that growth is kind of like the 20th century cherry on top of capitalism. It's the ideology that justifies the current system. So economic growth that idea hasn't been around forever. It only really was introduced in the late 1940s when you had this big conflict between, um, after the uh, Second World War, you had this big conflict between uh, specifically uh, the United States and um, the rising uh, communist and third world nations. And uh, at the same time within the United States, you had a conflict between a, a growing labor movement and the capitalist classes that were trying to um, regain uh, their their profits after the Second World War wiped a lot of them out. Um, so uh, economic growth entered into that environment as an ideology um, that justified basically the maximization of profit. It's the idea that um, you can measure the health of an economy by how much profit is being made. So gross national product, and now we call it gross domestic product, and or GDP. And um, we argue that, that it's basically a, hegem a, a hegemonic system where since that time, we, we've come to accept it as, as the way things are. Whenever uh, some, some, something happens, we talk about how much it affected GDP. Um, whenever uh, people protest or whenever people try to um, resist some kind of development, um, they're told that they're uh, affecting GDP, which in turn you know, uh, is, is bad for the country, is bad for working people. Um, so basically growth has become this kind of new tool in the toolbox to convince us, um, convince the working class, and then also convince the global south of why they need to, uh, for example, cut public services or why they should um, be happy with what they've got or why they shouldn't demand more. So, Aaron, capitalism, of course, dates back at least into the uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries. And you're telling me that the idea of growth only becomes hegemonic in the 1940s after the war. So what was growth in the context of capitalism before that? Yeah, so in, in, in the earlier period of capitalism, um, things have changed a lot. We, what we argue in the book is that um, there's precedence to this. Uh, idea of economic growth um, and those precedents are in kind of the um, the liberal uh, economic mindset which is that markets are separate from society they they kind of rule and govern themselves and that was based on the idea that humanity is is separate from nature um, that men are in inherently rational uh, rather than cooperative beings um, and those kinds of ideas really arose uh, and became uh, hegemonic uh, in, in the earlier uh, centuries of, of capitalism. 
and growth is kind of, it's an outgrowth of that idea. Um, at the same time, we also argue that um, even then, um, you could talk about a kind of material growth. So not a ideological or social growth. Um, you could talk about a growth of ma the material side of the economy. And when you trace certain things like how much um, energy an economy uses, how much uh, pollution it has, um, how, what the throughput is of an economic system, you can start seeing that acceleration happen basically in, in the um, 18th, 19th centuries. And then it starts accelerating exponentially um, until now. And so we argue that not only does capitalism have this uh, kind of drive for expansion, it also has an has a inherent material expansionist element, so a material growth. Indeed. And of course, uh, as degrowth becomes the specter haunting capitalism, so too does a specter haunter, haunt degrowth, and that is the specter of Thomas Malthus. So tell me how degrowth isn't just dressed up Malthusian thinking, Aaron. Yeah, so this gets um, kind of aimed at the degrowth argument a lot. They say it's, it's a neo-Malthusianism. So Malthus uh, was Thomas Malthus. He was a, a, a pastor and a political economist. He was famous for um, arguing that basically as economy grows, um, it's actually better for... It was basically a, an argument for why poor people need to be uh, limited and for why um, we shouldn't encourage poor people to reproduce because they're a drag on on the economy. Um, and so a lot of people, when they say, when they hear degrowth, they hear that kind of similar argument against population growth for the sake of uh, the economy. The thing is, Malthus, he was actually, when we talk about liberal economics, he was the founding father of, of liberal economics. What he argued was that in order for economic growth to um to uh to uh you know max in order for in order so that we can maximize economic growth we need to um we need to limit the uh working class poor populations so it was it was for the sake of economic growth that he saw there was some kind of natural limit um an imposed limit and some kind of uh, imposed scarcity of the world. And degrowth is basically the opposite of that. It's to say that actually um, we don't need economic growth. We're against the idea that we're, we need to build a society based purely on economic growth. What we need is a society that achieves well-being and satisfies people's needs for all. Um, so what we 